new Transtopia, male ballet dancers are taking dancing roles away from women. I guess all those poor women getting canceled by men just can decide to become men themselves, and then we can give them all cushy jobs as NFL quarterbacks. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to the Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness of back to K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Before we start, I want to take a quick moment to encourage everyone to download our brand new Freedom Project Media app. It is free to download. You can get it anywhere you can get apps. You get access to hundreds of hours of content and 15 news new shows every single week, absolutely free. Simply search Freedom Project Media on your smartphone, tablet, Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, any place else. You can also use the camera on your smart device to simply take a picture of the QR code on the screen right now and download it that easily. Just make sure you allow notifications once it's downloaded so you will be informed when we are sending you cool new free content. Okay, our first story takes us to Seattle, where nothing good seems to come from ever since Fraser Crane moved to San Francisco, where a world-famous dance program is being turned on its toes thanks to an 18-year-old boy who now identifies as gender fluid and now wants to dance girl parts. And when you see the video on this coming up in a moment, you will see the muscular difference. You're going to see to see that this boy is all man when it comes to his muscular development. He's got the body of Michael Jordan. And so what's happening here now is because uh, ba ba ballet is an ancient art, an art that is not American by culture, right? It's not American. We imported it from Europe, and yet we're going to decide now to change ballet in the name of progressivism. It's one of the, one of the really few few arts that really features women, that gives women the primary lead roles. Not anymore, right, Katie? Well, at least in this instance, we now have the 18-year-old, as you said, male ballet dancer. His name is Ashton Edwards, and he's actually from Flint, Michigan, and then he decided to move out to Seattle. And, you know, in the little news interview we're about to see, it was, you know, he's been dancing since he was a, a baby, essentially, and this is his dream. So let him live his dream. 18-year-old Ashton Edwards from Flint, Michigan, is a professional division student at the Pacific Northwest Ballet. He's been dancing since preschool. I always, like, dreamed of being a professional ballet dancer. Now he's the first ever male student to be formally studying on point here. It's a classical ballet technique where dancers are on their toes, feet vertical. The form makes dancers seem weightless and ethereal. The role is traditionally reserved for women float around the stage while the men kind of just assisted them. Ashton's the first student that has come to us and said, I'd like to study on point. Is that possible? If we're not listening and learning and keeping up, um, we're no longer relevant. What does that have to do with the ballet? If we're not learning and listening and keeping up, as producers apparently, we're not relevant. I got news for you, pal. You're really not relevant anywhere anymore anyway, and this is a way for you to try to get relevant. Maybe more people will go to the ballet, which is a great art form. Don't get me wrong, I'm not mocking the ballet. I've been to ballet. It is a, it is a excruciatingly disciplined uh, uh, form of dance. It's very hard. And yet, again, I go back to what I said before. This is one of the few art forms that was actually created with women in mind. I mean, you have uh, the roles of male ballerinas, and look, we've had great ones. We have people like Baryshnikov. Uh, we've had serious male dancers dancing serious ma ma male roles without having to take from women their roles. Here's the point. If this is a, ballet is about musculature, ballet is about a balance, ballet is about a lot of things that again, you could make an argument, biological men are going to have an advantage at. It's just the way it's going to be. And so if you're going to now turn the female roles, roles that require delicacy, delicacy a lightness, etherealness, we've already looked. This is, this is not new. My wife follows modern dance quite a bit, and she's already noticed how uh, they, they, all ballerinas used to be very tiny and petite. Now the big girl ballet is, is here, right? Now, just like stores now are advertising plus-sized women, ballet companies now are incorporating plus-sized women into ballet as well. It's changing the fundamental nature of ballet. Ballet is becoming Pilates. Ballet is becoming spin class, right? Or anybody who can don a tutu or a 4-4 four -four or whatever the hell it takes now gets to get out there prancing. It's totally like cheerleading, right? 
Uh, you remember what your cheerleaders were like when you were in high school? And now you look at the cheerleaders of the day, you recognize this is really all about inclusion. It has nothing to do with any kind of an aesthetic anymore. So many avenues to go down on that. But we'll go with what Edwards says about himself or herself or they self, apparently, because according to Edwards, he, him, she, her, they, them. I haven't hanged any labels yet, but I'm still learning because it's all about learning with everyone in ballet. Now, Dr. Duke, since you brought up the dancing and the tutus and all that have you ever wanted to be a ballet dancer just wondering no i never have to be honest with you uh, a dance is the is one of the being a you know terribly white guy terribly uncoordinated white guy dance is not something that's ever ever really appealed to me i've never seen dancing and said to myself hey that's cool i want to do that it's not my thing uh but i'm sure i, I need to be sent to a uh, uh a camp where i I learned my, my, unlearned my anti-male bigotry, I suppose. No, dancing has never appealed to me. And I will say this. Uh, if uh, you go back all the way through all the Hollywood dances, the only one that I can kind of watch and admire is Fred Astaire. Oh, that's true. I mean, he was very tall and he was very lanky. He was, very, he was a very, for lack of a better word, a very masculine dancer. Uh, he was very, it was all very, uh, very. Uh, coordinated. It was wow. all very... Elegant. I mean, I wouldn't want to be Fred Astaire. I'd like to be skinny as Fred Astaire, but I would not like to be Fred Astaire. But uh, no. Ba what about He's you? I mean, uh, you're, <laughs> what about you? Did you, as a young girl, did ballet ever yeah. appeal to you? No, I was too stocky in the leg, legature area. So I'm not petite. I'm petite in height, but I got some legs on me. All Don't right. Don't you worry. So yes. Mm. So again, um, we go back to the. The, the, the wild transformation of culture that's taking place in the name of gender. And when, when, when all these things are happening this quickly, without a lot of science, without a lot of, uh, of, of, of research being done, I mean, we, we're going to find out 10, 20, 30 years ago just what the consequences are of, of bringing hormone therapies and surgeries to underage children. That, that reckoning waits upon us. But the fact that this is moving as fast as it is tells you this is more about the politics of the thing than getting it right. Well, and if you want to go to your point of the entire thing about fluidity and how everything is changing quickly without science and that, here's what Edward says. I want to get your comment. He says, it's really exciting to see choreographers nowadays blurring the lines of gender binary and sexuality. We see men dancing with men and women dancing with women. And it doesn't always have to be a love connection. It can just be a partnership. Yeah, and none of that has anything to do with ballet. I mean, this, this is the thing. What you, what you forget what you're giving up here, right? You're giving up really the ballet. You're giving what the ballet means, what the, what the history and the culture of the ballet is. And uh, I get it. Right. Our job is to rewrite the past. I mean, that's what we've decided now, right? That every aspect of Western culture is bigoted. Ba the implication here is ballet is bigoted because pretty, young, thin, small, petite women dominate. And we just can't have that either. Again, if I were a feminist, and thank God, I'm, I guess, honestly, I guess I am a feminist because I'm the one saying this. If I were a woman, I would, uh, or a feminist, back when feminists used to mean equality, I would be extremely bothered by the fact that they keep coming for women's stuff. What do you see men, what do you see women taking away from men in, when it comes to athletics? Nothing. There's nothing a woman, a, a, a woman who transitions to a man, there's effectively nothing she's going to win. Effectively zero. Hello, Virginia. Uh, the Department of Education in Virginia, they've been busy all of last year because you know what? They had a deadline to meet. And they met that deadline at the end of 2020 where they needed to create model policies for school boards to follow about, you know, how to treat transgender students. And I just want to point out at this point, I, it dawned on me when I was reading this story, that we say transgender students, but we're not allowed to say disabled students because that's offensive. So we have to say students with disabilities. So can we say- Differently abled. Oh, diff okay, that's not what we were taught in education that, school. This is the new stuff, yeah. Since I, okay, yeah. then now they got another one. Anyway. Differently abled. Okay, so now should it be students with transgenderism? That's just a little side note. I want you to put a pin in it for okay. now, but you, you just, you think about pin it. Pin anyway, inserted. Now, these draft policies that the Department of Education in Virginia had uh, to create, they're public, and uh, they require students to use students' preferred pronouns. 
everybody must use a student's preferred pronoun and allow students to use their bathroom of choice. Of course, basically now, if you claim to be a student with transgenderism, you get to rule the roost. You get to do whatever you want. Students don't actually have to prove that they are transgender. There's no diagnosis, treatment, or legal documents that are necessary for students to assert their gender, uh, that it's different from their biological sex, and they get to gain access to whatever is offered In for other said words, transgenderism students with transgenderism. Is completely subjective. Completely. Utterly, thoroughly subjective, which makes it utterly, thoroughly. Yes. And this document, this that you can get from the Department of Education in Virginia, uh, has the names of the offer, uh, authors with their preferred pronouns, because you got to get the ball rolling, you know? You got to walk in their, their shoes. So, uh, which most of them, I do identify as the sex that they actually are. Uh, there's also a glossary of terms included, one of which is sex assignment. What's sex assignment, you may ask? Well, it's defined as a label, generally male or female, that is typically assigned at birth on the basis of a cluster of physical and anatomical features. Right. So in cluster. other words, sex assignment, actually calling sex boys assignment. boys and girls girls, is not actually tr truth anymore. It's not reality. It's some mean person, usually a male doctor, who is <laughs> forcing labels on some poor writhing baby just because it has a penis or a vagina. No, no, it has a cluster. Well, there's not just that. I guess with the well, men how about especially it would about, be a cluster of things. How about a cluster of chromosomes that say you're a How about of DNA? physical and anatomical features. Yeah. Now, intersex, they say, refers to someone who has a combination of chromosomes, gonads, hormones, internal sex organs, and genital differs from the two expected patterns of male or female. So now you know some of the terms that they've included. Well, Which, which by the way, are also utterly made up based on nothing but fancy and completely yeah. subjective. Yeah, our kids can't read, but now they're supposed to be expected to read new definitions that are this long and mean that. Well, those long, ridiculous definitions weren't meant to be read. Yeah, they're just a meant. They're just <laughs> they're meant to scare you into thinking that there's a lot of science and research behind this. So you just shut up and go along. Absolutely. Pretty much, you, whatever you say, you are, you are. And this is not going to stop at sex and gender. Oh. It's going to stop to your species. It's going to start to whether or not you're an animal. The furries are coming for you. The next great Joe Biden said in all of his bo boastfulness, transgenderism is the civil rights uh, uh, issue, issue of our, of our age. Yeah. Ten years from now, it's going to be people who want to identify as kittens and puppies and that not the, even that, that long that, i think it's not here. even that long yeah and so this whole thing a people alien idea we remember we did a show a couple years ago about a boy who identified as an alien mm, right yeah. he was not human he was sent here from another planet he can't prove it but asking him to prove it of course is bigoted against aliens i i just did a story on PETA and how you're being a speciesist it's already yes, here it's here yep, um are. so back to these guidelines or not even guidelines rules not uh, even rules made up crap mandates so mandates. they Man regarding the <laughs> re regarding the preferred pronoun usage teachers especially or any staff must use the preferred pronouns of said students or face disciplinary action um, because that's a form of harassment it's also a form of harassment to force a professor or a teacher to use a pronoun that he knows is wrong or she knows is wrong is true. and that violates their conscience. But here's, here's where it gets really bad. Parents, your role in this whole oh, thing yes. with the parents and the schools and the schools manipulating and hiding. So parents must also obey. In addition, faculty and staff are to be told to create short-term solutions uh, should a student's parent or guardian not accept their kid's claim of transgenderism. Such a plan may include addressing the student at school with their asserted name and pronoun while using the legal name and pronoun associated with the sex assigned at birth when communicating so with the parents lying. or the guardians. Covering up. And we're yep. not done. And There's by the way, more. That lying is not subjective. No. Here's the more. School staff are also encouraged to provide families that aren't on board with the claims with information um, to get them in line. So you got to like get them in line too, not yep. just, yeah. Mm. Uh, you, as a teacher, that, you're responsible for, wait, as a teacher, you're responsible to lying to parents, yes. if we say so, and you're responsible for educating par parents yes. if they don't go along. And if they don't go along, that getting in line can include calling Child Protective Services, mm -hmm. we've joked half-heartedly, but pretty serious, 
on how this is going to happen. Now they're actually saying it. Call Child Protective Services if they feel a student is being abused, neglected, or at risk of abuse or neglect by their parent due to their transgender and identity. And neglect. By not agreeing, you're neglecting them. Yep. By not agreeing, you're abusing them, right? By denying what they say, say they are, you are already guilty before the call is placed. And... I'm not done yet. There's even more. School staff are instructed to help students come to terms <laughs> with their gender identity without, without involving or informing their parents or guardians. Yep. Shh, it's our secret. And this continues, my friends. How long now, how many thousands of days have we been talking to you over the course of this show about Notice, we'll tell you the next time we actually get a serious education story that deals with serious learning. Literacy, math skills, science proficiency. When do you ever hear the schools talk about any of this anymore? You never do. This is what the schools are spending their time, all their time doing, appropriating from you, the parents, all the rights and responsibilities and liberties that parents should have while holding you accountable for what they don't like. Since we're going to be on the note all day here about transgenderism, let's take it up a notch to the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, or once was. Uh, they like to take to Twitter a lot and put out their thoughts. And so the ACLU decided to go on a little tweet storm. Let's, let's, yeah, they, they talked about the four myths about trans people in school sports and how they're debunking. The four myths so what does about the, trans excuse people me, what is the in AS, schools. What does the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, have to do with rewriting gender? What, what is this? What, what's the staying relevant. Staying relevant. So the ACLU is angry that people aren't treating trans people like trans people. Yeah. So let's remember that Joe Biden, basically, I think it was day one he did this. Day one, day two, day three. All he's been doing is signing executive orders. But on one of the first days, he signed the Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation Executive Order. And as it states, every person should be treated with respect and dignity and should be able to live without fear no matter who they are or whom they love. Except your girl. Unless it's uh, Donald unless, Trump. Uh, Don't uh, love uh, Donald Trump. Right. Or you're a girl who yeah, wants to win a state tra ch uh, championship in track. Oh, yeah. You and can't you can't because there's boys running against you. Those athletes and those girls don't matter according to joe biden yeah so basically they they see how you came out and was like yo i'm gonna defend you joe we're gonna debunk all these attackers hating on you so that's what they did so they put out four facts they say uh for these four myths that they're debunking number one sex is binary apparent at birth and identifiable through singular biological characteristics that's what the myth is but I'm looking at But I'm, really that's the truth. I'm looking at the myth and they've not debunked anything. They say biological sex and gender are not binary. Yes, they are. Scientifically they are. There are no set hormone ranges, body parts, or chromosomes that all people of a particular Yes, there are. Yeah. Now now, now you're now they're saying, right, that once you go through surgery and have your male appendages removed, that changes you. No, that doesn't. That means you're an amputee. It doesn't mean you're a girl. Yeah, so what they're doing is they're giving what they call is the myth. But really, you got to read this backwards, everyone. When it says myth, it means fact. They're, they're claiming that trans girls are girls, and then they give out what they think is the, this sad myth, which it is not. That's the truth. All right, going on to number two. They say fact number two is that trans athletes do not have an unfair advantage in sports, and that the myth is that trans athletes physiological characteristics provide an unfair advantage over cis athletes. They do, well, but not the, according to them. Look at the first sentence. It's a non sequitur. Trans athletes vary in athletic ability. Okay, so this trans boy may not run as fast as that trans boy. Therefore, because there's not all trans athletes aren't the same, everybody's on an equal playing <laughs> field. No, this boy can outrun that boy by three seconds. Both boys can outrun all women by four seconds. So d y your argument Stop here is it. not math an argument. Stop it. Math is racist. Math is that's, that's exactly why math is racist because you use it to point out stuff like this. All right. Well, fact three, according to them, is that including trans athletes will benefit everyone. How? Well, the myth is that the participation of trans athletes hurts cis women. We just pointed out how that is actually the truth, that having trans athletes, males, against actual biological women Notice is not 
fair. Now, notice that they don't give you a reason. They say excluding women who are trans hurt. How? How does it hurt all women to not let w boys run with women? How does it hurt all women not to let boys who think they're women run with the girls? Go back to that. How does it? You're not making an argument. It invites gender policing. Right. So now realizing that there are male and female is policing gender. No, ACLU, you're the one who are policing opinions ability to understand what the truth is. You're the one trying to police people's opinions, not us. Well, all the police are bad. So fact number four. Trans people belong on the same teams as other students. And then their myth that they claim is a myth says that trans students need separate teams. We've been arguing, well, yeah, just give them separate teams then if that's what they want. But no, because according to the ACLU, trans people belong on the same teams as other students. Like, yes, the boys belong with the boys and girls with the girls. You what? know what? But I, I guarantee it. you. I I guarantee you that if a bunch, this is what should happen, a bunch of boys who insist they're per perfectly male, that they are all male, they are not transgender, we are cisgendered Christian boys. No. We demand no. to play on women's sports teams. <laughs> I guarantee you the ACLU would pitch a fist a fit about that. But all those oh, yeah. boys would have to say is, for for now, I'm transgender, and all of a sudden it goes away. All right, well, that's here, how you break this. Down. Here we go. Let's just end this on a positive note. Say it with us: Trans people belong everywhere, including on sports teams. The ACLU. And of course, here's what they do: they they put a link there that take action, and of course, it's a petition to sign for transgender. Blah blah blah. The ACLU is so beclowned themselves; they're no better than the Southern Poverty Legal Center. Now they're the exact the exact same organizations. That's not a center. good thing. It's time for some real education. Welcome to G.K. Chesterton Week here on Instant Classics. The man with the mustache, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, was an English philosopher, theologian, art critic, and a preeminent Christian apologist. Born in 1874, Chesterton described himself as an Orthodox Christian and eventually converted to Catholicism. In many ways, Chesterton's way of thinking was an extension of such Victorian writers as Matthew Arnold, John Henry Newman, and John Ruskin. His greatest works were Orthodoxy and the Eternal Man. Chesterton sadly died in 1936. If it weren't been, if it wasn't for C.S. Lewis, you might be able to call, and you still might be able to call G.K. Chesterton one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Christian apologists of the 20th century. Lewis himself learned much when he Christ, uh, converted back to Christianity. So we're, we're going to spend a week honoring uh, G.K. Chesterton for his contribution to Christian apologetics. Apologetics. Here's our first quote from the great man: "Journalism possesses in itself the potentiality of becoming one of the most frightful monstrosities and delusions." that have ever cursed mankind. This horrible transformation will occur at the exact instance at which journalists realize that they become, can become an aristocracy. Tell me that's not the reality of today. Journalists have decided that they are a kind of fourth wheel. They are a extrovert, a fourth uh, a system of government in this country. The journalists in this country are the new aristocrats. They will decide what's hip and what's not, what's allowable and what's not. Chesterton, 100 years ago, Chesterton warned you, when journalists figure out that they can behave like aristocrats, journalism will turn into a monstrosity that destroys culture. Chesterton was right. All right, just a quick reminder to please download the brand new Freedom Project Media app. All you have to do is use the camera on your smart device to take a picture of one of the QR codes that is right in front of you. You'll get access to our 15 new shows a week, plus our library of content that includes in-depth interviews, lecture series, educational animations, and so much more. All you have to do is download the Freedom Project app in your app store, and please make sure you allow for notifications. And if you're a fan of our media, you know, why aren't you, please consider a one-time tax-deductible donation to support our Patriot Club, and we're going to send you an awesome signature tumbler as just a little thank you. All you have to do to sign up is visit patriotclub.us. That's patriotclub.us. Before we go, we want to take a moment to show some love, as we do from time to time here, about our Patriot Club members. And today, we're going to give a shout-out to Paul from Edmond, Oklahoma. Hey, Paul. Thank you for supporting us. Used to live down in Stillwater, Oklahoma when I was teaching at Oklahoma State, so shout out to Edmund. And that's our show for Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke Shuskady. Until next time, stay educated, mes amis.